sit up there. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you to Medford United Methodist Church. Happy Easter to all of you. As we get started, I want to invite you to take a moment. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. I hope that you'll pass it down and then pass it back toward the center. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. And also, if you are visiting with us today, maybe for the first time, we want to say thank you so much for being here. I hope that you'll take a moment. At the bottom of the page, you can share with us some of your contact information. We would love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. And speaking of that, I want to just share with you a couple of things that you'll find in the bulletin, a little bit more information about. We have our Vacation Bible School uh, that's going going to be happening this summer and I want you to take a look and look at the dates look at the times maybe they'll work for you if you have children you have grandchildren in your family we have a wonderful program here it always fills up so if you're interested make sure that you pay attention to the uh, the date we're going to open registration and uh, kind of uh, be right in line with that date because one of the things that happens is we always have to turn people away and we're sad about that but um, the reality is we want to make sure that everybody has a great experience so that's one of the reasons why we do that. So I hope that you'll take a look at that. Also, we also have a wonderful preschool here. And if you're looking for an opportunity uh, for your uh, child or your grandchild, uh, ages two and a half up to age five, we would love to talk to you about our preschool as well. They're registering now for the fall of 2018. So as we begin here, I'm going to invite Pastor Kathleen to bring in the light, the Paschal candle. The light of Christ. Life is stronger than death. The light of Christ. <clears throat> he rose victorious from the grave. The light of Christ. Now his power is at work in us. Amen. Creator God, through Jesus Christ, you have offered us the light of life eternal. Jesus, rekindle in us the holy desire to shine forth with the hope and power of your resurrection. May you ever light our way, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we're able and sing together this opening hymn. <laughs>
peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment now and greet those around us with the peace of Christ. Nobody can move very far. I'd like to invite our children now to come forward for our very special children ta children's time. Alana Miller is going to be helping me, and this is going to give you a little hint. A little hint. And for those of you who may be new among us, 
Um, if you have children who are preschool up to age kindergarten, and if they get a little antsy as the, sermon, as the service goes on, we've moved our child care over into the new building. So it's upstairs in the new building if you find you're in need of it. I'm sure one of our ushers will be able to help you find it if you haven't done that yet. So hi, everybody. So what's this? Egg hunt. Yeah, did you have an egg hunt today? Oh, 18 eggs? Well, Miss Alana has a very special visitor, and she's going to tell you all about the eggs and her special visitor. So this is one of my Easter egg chickens. It's actually what the breed is called. You guys hear me now? No? Yes? No? Remember the eggs <laughs> All right, how about now? Hey. All right. So this is Zazu. She is an Easter egg or chicken, which descends from the Araucanas, which um, were found in Chile. She actually lays green eggs. Um, I have six um, Easter eggers. They all look a little bit different. Some lay blue eggs, some lay green, a couple different shades. So you guys, do you, did you dye eggs for Easter? Yeah? <gasps> Maybe? Well, these guys just do it naturally every day. <laughs> every day. So it's pretty cool. And then some of my other breeds, you can see some of them lay like pink eggs or light tan or darker brown eggs, which is pretty cool. Uh -huh. um, so fresh eggs, actually, fun fact, don't have to be refrigerated. Um, hens lay them with a membrane around the shell called a bloom, which keeps bacteria and viruses from getting in. So as long as they're not pasteurized or washed, they're actually good out on the counter for about a month, month and a half. Um, so if you go to like Europe or South America, um, you might just find them out on the shelf for sale, which is pretty cool. Um, another cool thing, I don't know if you guys will be able to see, so these are her ears right here, and do you see how they're kind of green on the inside? Do you see that? I know it's hard for you, you guys really can't see. Um, some hens, you can kind of see the color on the inside of their ears indicates what color egg they lay, so that's pretty cool. Um, all these eggs are completely the same nutritionally. I know a lot of people think like, oh, brown eggs are healthier than white eggs. It's not true at all. It's just uh, <laughs> whole foods taking your money. So uh, uh, the thing is that uh, chickens that lay white eggs don't um, usually aren't as big, so they're cheaper to keep. They don't eat as much. Um, so that's why those eggs are usually cheaper. But someone decided brown eggs are cool. And now someone's decided green and blue eggs are cool. So honestly, I think they're pr all pretty cool. Um, so one of my favorite things on Easter is singing in church and choir and stuff, and I love all the hymns we sing. Chickens sing. So chickens make all sorts of vocal sounds to each other. They can purr. They have alarm calls if they, like, sense that there's a hawk overhead. So... <laughs> where I live. I thought heads would be pretty quiet. My neighbors and I were both disappointed. Um, so, so they do this. So um, the hens will lay an egg about every day um, and they go and they sit in their nesting boxes and then as soon as they lay their egg they jump up and they sing the song. So um, sometimes the other hens join in too and it's a whole chorus of chickens in the yard but um, some people think that what it is is it's like a distraction, so the hen will start singing, making a big noise, and then run away from the nest. So that kind of distracts predators, so they don't know where the eggs are. Some other people think that maybe they're calling out to their other chickens because they've been sitting on their nest and they don't know where their friends are in the yard or the field. Um, and so that's how they find each other. Personally, I think that they're just pretty proud of what they did and they want to <laughs> sing about it. So, but it's pretty cool, so. Anyway, um, I'll have her after the service if you guys want to pet them. And I have brought her friend too, so they're pretty cool. Before you go back to your seats, let's take a moment to say a prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the new life that is all around us, for these chickens, for these eggs, for bunnies, and, and for babies. We give you thanks. And most of all, we give you thanks for the new life that has been given to us through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, take care. <laughs>
Our reading this Easter morning is from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Patty. So, I don't know if you noticed, but it's not only Easter, but it's also April Fool's Day. So far, nothing has happened. So that's good. You know, I briefly considered, there's a, there's a long history and a tradition of actually making this a day, because it is a day of great joy, making this a day act, to tell jokes. And um, that goes back to the idea that was originally some, some Greek um, writers and uh, theologians had this idea that this was the ultimate joke on the devil, right? Raising Jesus up from the dead was the ultimate joke on the devil. And so, you know, I considered for a minute, uh, maybe as a way of lightening the mood, showing the, uh, that clip from Monty Python's The Holy Grail. Do you know the one I'm talking about? <clears throat> Not dead yet, right, that one? Um, but finally, I decided that if, uh, if you didn't already know the movies, you'd think it was kind of dumb, and it is dumb. <clears throat> so, but this tradition, You know, in in Germany in the 1600s, apparently it was getting out of hand. And I don't know exactly why the Pope decided that it was getting out of hand. Um, I can imagine, though. You know, it was the day before they hadn't invented Sharpies yet, you know. So I'm just thinking, it must have been really difficult to prepare for the opening monologue because the cue cards were really tough to put together without the Sharpies, you know. Um, Anyway, fortunately for you, the joke writers, the church's joke writers, they're on strike. And um, so we'll just stick to the story this morning. So let's take a moment, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your gifts in our lives. We thank you for your power at work in the world. And we thank you for the joy of this day, 
for the fact that you have given us life and life eternal. And just pray that you would be at work among us, that you would surround us um, with your Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to encourage us in this moment. Lord, we pray that we might hear the good news. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the mistakes I think that we make in thinking about Easter is we can very easily look at this day. We can think about this story and the fact that, you know, Jesus lived on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago. You know, we look at him, you look at his life, we say, here's a person, he's never married, never had kids, you know, um, didn't have a job, didn't have a mortgage to pay. You know, we look at his life and we say, you know, what does this story have to do with me? I don't really get what's, you know, so important about this. I understand that. I mean, I get it. We're talking about a man who rose from the dead. That's what the story is about. But I would challenge you, if you think that the story has nothing to do with you, I always think about the reality that the Christian church has been proclaiming the story not just on Sunday, not just on Easter Sunday, but every Sunday of the year for 2,000 years. This is the story that defines who we are. We believe in the power of God. That's what we believe. More than anything, we believe in the power of God. And so I want to tell you, it does have to do with you. It does have to do with you. It has to do with me. And I say that because there are three really important points that this story reinforces, that this story instructs us in. And I would say these are the three points. First, the first thing that we learn is our God is greater than our circumstances. The second thing we learn is that death is not the end. And the third thing that we learn is that our new life starts right now. So these three points, and I want to talk a little bit about each one of these points. Start by thinking about the disciples. Just consider what they went through. Think about the women who followed Jesus and what they went through. Think about Jesus' mother and what she went through. That week between Palm Sunday and Easter, if you can picture this, the disciples on Palm Sunday, and this is the story that we read last week, they must have imagined that they were on the brink of something that was huge. Jesus is coming into town and the people are proclaiming him as king. And so you can just imagine that the disciples are there, they're looking at what's happening, they're looking at these crowds, and they're saying to themselves, we are about to make history. They can't imagine what's going to happen in the next six days. They can't imagine that Jesus would be betrayed, that he would be uh, put on trial, that he would be sentenced to die. They can't imagine any of these things. They think that they're on the brink of something that's going to be amazing and wonderful. And here they are, standing outside the tomb. You know, it seems like I've spent a lot of time lately talking with families, talking with individuals, talking with friends of mine and people in the church who have kind of been in the same place that the disciples must have found themselves in, where they felt like they were on the edge of something that was really going to be great in their lives, something that was going to be amazing. They had a new job coming up, you know, being accepted into a program that they were really excited about and really looking forward to. And what they find out is that the last minute Oh, it's not happening. Oh, I didn't get the position. Maybe you find yourselves in that kind of place today. Maybe you were on just looking forward to something that was going to be taking place a little later this year, and you get this diagnosis, and you say, now I have to deal with this. This is part of who we are. This is the kind of thing that comes into our life all the time. But the good news of the morning, it's found really right there in the very first line of this story. What does it say? On the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark. While it was still dark. I want you to hold on to this idea 
that God is at work while it's still dark. Now, preachers can say this a million different ways and have said this a million different ways, but the point is always the same, that God is bigger than our circumstances, that God is bigger than the things that are in our way, that God still rolls stones away in order for us to exit out of those tombs, in order for us to know God's power at work in our lives. Think about what it is that we are saying when we come here to church. When we talk about the idea that you invite God into your life, who are you inviting exactly? You're inviting the same power that created the entire universe. You're inviting the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You're inviting that power, that God, to be at work in your life. Do you think that doesn't make a difference? It makes all a difference in the world. So that's the first point, the idea that God is greater than our circumstances. So the second point, this idea that death is not the end. Death is not the end. So think about this for a moment. Think about the thing that you fear most in the world. Now imagine, imagine if that thing that you feared was, let's say, heights. And let's say I came to you and I handed you a cape that if you put on this cape that you would be able to fly. Now wouldn't it take and render that fear that you have of heights, wouldn't it render it kind of meaningless in the sense that you know what, you put this on, you're not going to fall. No matter what, you're not going to fall. Would you put it on? Would you put it on? And that's what Easter is about. It's about the idea that death is this thing that is following us around for our whole life. Death is this kind of shadow that falls across every one of our lives. But Easter, what it says to us is, I do not need to be afraid of you anymore. And then if you take a step back from that and you say, well, okay, if death is the thing, that inevitable thing that we're all afraid of, and if we don't need to be afraid of that thing anymore, then what is there left for us to be afraid of? Now, I confess, I don't live like that all the time. I don't know that any of us do. But when I start to feel afraid, I try to remember, even if I have to tell myself a hundred times a day, to step back and take this view to say, what's wrong with you? If you don't need to be afraid of death, what is there to be afraid of at all in the world? What is there left to be afraid of? So even though we have this cape that lets us fly, the question is, will we put it on? Death is not the end. So if there's one more reason why I think it's important for us to remember that Easter matters, it's this one. It's the idea that new life starts right now. So in Jesus' time, you know, when we read the Bible, we read about these people called the Pharisees. And one of the things that the Pharisees taught was that there would be a resurrection. So this idea of resurrection was prevalent. People talked about it. People thought about it. People understood that there would be a resurrection, but the Pharisees, their idea of a resurrection, their understanding of it was that it would happen for everybody all at once at the end of time. When the Messiah came, when the new world came, then all would be raised and there would be a judgment. Jesus takes that thing that people believed and he turns it on its head. He says, no, it's happening right now. Because I don't know about you, if somebody comes to me and tells me, well, I have some good news for you. This good news will take place at some point in the future, or it might not. Thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years in the future. It's going to be great news. You will rise from the dead. I'd be like, okay. Okay. You know, it's hard for me to get excited about that, right? It's hard for me to imagine, you know, I'll be dead. What do I, at that point, I've been dead 2,000 years. What do I care, right? But when we talk about Jesus' resurrection, what we're saying 
is that new life starts right now. That it starts whenever we invite God into our lives. Whenever we invite Jesus into our circumstances, our new life can start right now. We need new life. We need to know that God is at work. We need to know that we've been forgiven. We need to know that we are beloved. God knows that we need that, not a thousand years from now, not 2,000 years from now, but right now. And so that's what Easter is about for us, the fact that it takes place right now. There's one writer who puts it this way. Easter proves that God's kingdom has come not at the end of time, but within time. In other words, we took that thing that was way out here and we're moving it right up to now, right up to today. Now, that does not mean that everything in the world is suddenly perfect. We know that. We understand it. But what we do know is that we can be assured that we already know how the story ends, no matter what we can be assured that we know how the story ends. If you open up the Bible, you flip to the last page, let me tell you the first thing that you will notice is, spoiler alert, right? God wins. In the end, God wins. And what's true at the end of the time is true for us as well. It's true in our lives that no matter what, we can trust that in the end, that God wins. So we've read the last page of our book. So that victory that begins on Easter Sunday with the resurrection of Jesus, it's not just his victory, but it's our victory too. It's our victory when we believe that God's power is greater than our circumstances. It's our victory when we believe that death is not the end. And it's our victory when we know that new life starts right now. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And amen. Amen. <coughs>
be seated. As we enter into our time of prayer together, I invite you to center yourself where you are. Just take a moment to take a few deep breaths. Let us pray. God of us all, we give you thanks for your love and and for your grace and for your power on this blessed resurrection morning. We thank you. We thank you for the brilliance of colors on us and around us and in our Easter eggs that remind us of new life. Today, gracious God, we gather to remember and to celebrate. We remember Jesus who healed the sick and raised the dead. We pray for those among our members and friends who are ill, for those who are receiving treatment or awaiting treatment for life-threatening illnesses. We pray for those in hospitals, rehabilitation centers, care facilities, those recuperating at home. We pray for Philip and for Julia. We pray for their children. And we pray for those we name aloud or those we name silently in our hearts. We remember Jesus who gathered children to himself and who dealt kindly with women and who loved all those who were considered outcasts of society. We pray for the children of our preschool and our congregation. We pray for Mary Ellen on her birthday. We pray for the women and children in our country and around the world who are oppressed, who suffer injustice, And we pray for all who struggle to be the people you created them to be. Hear our prayers for the situations and the people we name aloud or silently. We remember Jesus who always kept the mission in the forefront. And we pray for our mission partners and we think of Reach in Roanoke. We think of Turning Point and we pray too for Christian Caring Center, for the Interfaith Hospitality Network for homeless families. We pray for Urban Promise, for New Beginnings, and so many others. We remember Jesus who consented to suffer and die at the hands of his enemies. And today we celebrate the fact that death could not hold Jesus in the grave. We celebrate that not even death is able to separate us from the love of God. And we celebrate the new life that we have in Christ. We celebrate the assurance that we have of eternal life. Today we celebrate And we give thanks that in life, in death, in life after death, we belong to you, O God. Hear us now, loving God, as we pray together that prayer Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as our ringers get into position here for our offertory, we want to share with you, we wrapped up uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've been doing a food drive, and we have a, a video that's kind of a wrap up of where we landed with that. So we want to share that with you right now. Good morning, food fans. Once again, this is Ben Carl, representing our MEMC youth, and welcome to Food Center with our final March Madness Food Drive update. First off, we want to say a huge thank you to Youth Director Bethany Carl, the youth leaders, and the MEMC youth for their help building boxes, sorting, counting, and packing the food. Without their help on Sunday nights, none of this would have been possible. And a very special thank you to Outreach Committee Food Drive Coordinator, Karen Dvorak Humphreys, for offering her time and for bringing cake on the final night of packing. And now over to Outreach Committee Chair Chris Carl for the final scores. Thanks, Ben. Here are the final March Madness Food Drive scores for 2018. The Pitts Bag Boxers ended with 652 items, and the gift cards finished with $1,170 in Acme gift cards. Our newcomers, the George Mason Jar U Buccaneers, scored an impressive 1,234, but the Arbor State Toiletries hold on for a commanding win by earning an EFTN record 1,290. Their mid-tournament edition of Tide Pods surely made a difference. While the Arbor State Toiletries were the victors for our tournament, the true winners are the families served by the Christian Caring Center and the Turning Point United Methodist Church Food Pantry. All the food and toiletry items together added up to a grand total of 3,176 items, which is 279 items and additionally four gift cards more than the 2017 collection. Congratulations, Medford UMC. The entire online donation is being sent to Turning Point, while the items collected here at Medford UMC were proportionally divided to balance the donations between both organizations. Without the support of our youth fellowship, our leaders, and most importantly, each and every person who donated, this would not have been possible. For Chris Carl, the MEMC Youth, the Outreach Committee, and all of us here at EFDN, the Easter Food Drive Network, we thank you all for your generosity and support. Happy Easter, and for the final time, I am Ben Carl signing off. Back to you, Joe and Kathleen. <laughs> So we do want to thank all of you who participated in this. You know, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Ben uh, for being a good sport and do, and partaking in this um, and his father's craziness. Um, <clears throat> and we want to thank Chris uh, for working hard on those videos as well. Really appreciate that. But this is what um, this is what we do together, and we're really grateful for your support. And uh, this is another opportunity for you to help us in our ministry. We uh, now receive an offering, and we thank you for your generosity.
God of resurrection, may these gifts we have given be used to bring renewed life in our world. Hope, Hope to the to despairing, despairing, joy to, to the depressed, depressed peace to, to the dismayed, dismayed love to all of your children everywhere. We give this offering to you in the name of your Son, the resurrected one, Jesus. We'll continue our worship by singing hymn 304. If you'd like to sing the Hallelujah Chorus, we invite you to come forward during this time. the good news, the good news of God's hope and possibility. Carry with you the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. In him all God's promises are true. <laughs> 